You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. It is David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy with the That Gratitude Guy podcast. Welcome, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show or gratitude nugget, uh, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one to three takeaways from today's show, from the show or my guest or what have you. Uh, My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, quite a large network that goes out to a lot of people. And I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com and or email at david at thatgratitudeguide.com. And the contact information and social media notes are in the show notes. So let me get move forward here and introduce my guest. I think you're going to like my guest today. I had to shorten this bio intro quite a bit (laughs) because it's pretty lengthy. So I just took a few highlights here. But uh, Ann Bremner attended, attended Stanford University where she studied medieval history, graduated in 1980 with honors, She describes herself as a Democrat who was opposed to capital punishment. She went on to the Seattle University School of Law, where she completed her JD degree in 1982. From 83 to 88, Bremner was a deputy prosecuting attorney with the criminal division of the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, specializing in sex crimes. Bremner was a lawyer at Stafford Fry Cooper in Seattle from 88 to 2012. During her career in private practice, Bremner represented law enforcement and judges in various civil and criminal cases. And as I said, I could go on quite a bit longer with the many, many things of Miss Bremner, but I think it's better to just get right to my guest and introduce her. Ann Bremner, welcome to the podcast. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You bet. You bet. And just as way of context, I always like to kind of start out is uh, tell the listeners how you and I met. Through Faith Ireland, a Supreme Court justice who highly recommended I talk to you, and you're very famous and well-known anyway. I mean, I knew who you were and of all the good things you do and the gratitude that you spread, you know, in others for people to feel gratitude. And, you know, Faith was a world champion weightlifter and also on the, a justice on the Supreme Court, one of the most amazing women I've ever met, and she thinks you're beyond amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. And she is amazing. And I remember when she said, I, you know, I need to introduce you to my good friend, Ann Bremner. And I said, oh gosh, I've heard of Ann and the things that you've done and so on. And I'm still fascinated about this. I think about this in sometimes my speaking, when people come up to the book table afterwards and they want to buy the journals and the books and things, or Mm -hmm. you just introduce somebody, Ann, this is Fred, Fred, this is Ann. I'm always fascinated by how in about 30 to 60 seconds, you make an impression of what that person, how you like or don't like that person. And Mm -hmm. I'd say the majority of the times it's pretty good, but it's still there's times I've met people and it's like, whoa, where did you meet this person? (laughs) They're kind of a nut. So anyway, so so let me start off with, as I mentioned uh, before we were online, is this whole concept of how the work that we do and how we intersplice gratitude or appreciation and thankfulness. One of the first questions I have for you is how did it impact the type of work that you do trying to be grateful, trying to be appreciative or thankful, considering some of the knuckleheads that you deal with. I mean, I guess that's a fair word. My dad right. is an attorney. He always used knuckleheads and deadbeat and things like that. But how did uh-huh. that impact you over time? Did you find, was it hard to try to maintain a, a great persona when you're dealing with some of these characters? Well, I always feel like it's important to be part of something bigger than yourself. And so I think that's given me gratitude in terms of being a prosecutor or helping victims or you know, working on cases involving children um, and those who've gone through civil process to try and get redress, especially in our recent case involving the Cox kids that were murdered by their dad, were in the care, custody, and control of the state. It's an example because it's a horrific case, but we, we received justice for that family. We had a wonderful jury. It was tried during a pandemic and the jury returned a verdict of almost $100 million, um, mm. one of the highest in state history. So that's an example of a terrible case, horrific crime, terrible circumstances with the result that was very gratifying. And so I guess the answer to your question is, 
there's a silver lining in a lot of these cases <laughs> and that's what keeps me going and I have gratitude for the people that I represent and the system and the jurors, especially in this recent case. And I'm kind of curious because that was such a, a notorious case and so very, very sad. Uh, one thing I'm kind of wondering about is it doesn't really matter because the person representing CPS or whatever uh, represents the big agency, but was there kind of a lesson to be learned? Was this person not very attentive? Was she just not doing her job? I mean, because obviously something fell through the cracks and the outcome was horrible, but was there something that, that came out in the case that showed that somebody had just not checked a lot of boxes or something? Exactly. Well, they did check a box. They, there are a lot of boxes they checked, but the fact is they didn't do certain things. There were 46 red flags that they missed wow. that were indicative of danger to the kids. But the one worst thing was inattention, but a, a deliberate act too. A caseworker, when she knew Josh Powell had killed his wife and was dangerous to the kids and the kids had been witnesses to the murder. There was probable cause to believe all those things. And they'd ordered him to have a psychosexual evaluation and a polygraph, which of course he didn't want to take as he was a suspect in killing his wife. That worker decided nevertheless to have those kids see their dad in his home as opposed to a secure setting. That, that was the single most important act of negligence in this case. Wow, wow. And, and I think again, where the average person, at least as, as near as I would think, doesn't come across a lot of um, ne'er-do-wells in society. And right. on an earlier conversation, I, I want you to repeat this because it made me laugh. <laughs> I just love your dad's comment about some people and would you mind sharing that with the listening audience about just how some people are wired or what happens to them? Well, I mean, he said just some people, that's just the way they are. But you mean the one where he said they're nuts? They're nuts. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, he's, he's, he's a very, um, I, I love my dad. He's a wonderful person. I always thought he should be president. But um, he's a psychiatrist and he would testify in criminal cases and they would ask him, Dr. Bremner, what do you think? And he'd say, it's nuts, it's crazy. I mean, what else is there, right? So That's it's always why. good, I think, to, to, to use the sprezzatura, which is making complicated things simple, kind of a rule that I live by. And that's something I think I learned from my dad. I think it's so great because I think people, at least maybe I was in this group, was expect I would be expecting something much deeper and something a lot more thought. No, he's nuts. What, can we go to the next question? <laughs> exactly. Uh, because it's just, there's just people. I mean, you could use all sorts of analogies. You go buy, you go to a store and there's a bunch of apples and the old one bad apple. And there's all these beautiful apples and there's one with a big worm in it or something. There's just going to be <laughs> right. things in life. It's just going to happen too. So, right. Um, but I think so, and not that this is why we adjudicate cases or things like this, but <clears throat> is, it, is it possible to say that just going back to the Powell thing for a second, I'm really curious because it was such a big case, that, they, that CPS in this case learned their lesson and this won't happen again? Because you think about, gosh, if something, you mentioned the silver line, if something good comes out of it, does the, does the uh, operation of the department improve? Well, we hope so. I mean, we hope so. Like I said to the jury, I said, I said to the jury, ask yourselves, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? In terms of making this declaration that this can't happen and this was terribly wrong. We haven't received any indication they've changed at all. You would hope they would. And I have jurors. I mean, all my jurors in this case want to help basically revamp CPS with the laws. Here's one example. Charlie and Braden's law passed in Utah. That's the name of the children. But didn't right. pass here in the law would be basically if one spouse is believed there's probable cause to believe one spouse has caused the disappearance or killed another spouse mm -hmm. they can't have the kids it's just simple they cannot have yeah. the children those are the kinds of things i think we need in this state we need cps to so, you know, basically focus on the welfare of the kids and not reunification at any cost right so does the case itself actually spur them into any action or is it kind of something else from these laws that come out of it in terms of if there's a big lawsuit, I would think they'd say, well, we got to change things, but does that necessarily happen? No, and I, I think we've seen over the years a lot of headlines about CPS and, and dead children and molested children and lost children and everything else. And do I see a change? I don't, personally. Mm -hmm. Do I hope for a change? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And so if, if we look at Ann Bremner, the person you see in the mirror, how have, has your attitude changed? You've practiced law and been a prosecutor and done all these things with all these high, you know, high uh, falutin cases, I should say high profiles, what I was thinking about. And so uh -huh. have you noticed in your time from way back then to now, has your sort of perspective changed? Are you figured that I know what you said about the silver line, which I really like, but have you softened a little bit just by seeing all these things over time as, a, as maybe yeah. the ad versus the attitude you had way back when? 
Absolutely. When I was a prosecutor, I was hell bent on taking the bad guys and gals down and everything was a little bit, well, not fully, but a little black and white to me, more so than it is now. I think as you get older and you work in the system, you gain a lot of empathy yeah. um, for people that even the nuts or the people that are the bad apple or anything else. You, I think having seen a lot of different cases over my lifetime and, and tried a lot of cases, for example, the Mary Kay Letourneau case, I have a civil case, and I had to kind of come to understand what she went through. And there was a Hollywood producer that says, if you squint your eyes, it all makes sense. And I thought, well, that's an interesting perspective. Oh, interesting. You remember her, you know, her relationship with a young man and they had two right. children and he was 13. So it, just to get that perspective, and I was defending the police in that case. So it was our position that they would end up together anyway. And in fact, they did and they got married. Yeah. And again, from just being a person who stands on the sidelines and watches this and sees what you get in the news or the paper or the TV or whatever, I don't have as much a connection to say you would have obviously, but is it just from using that one as an example, because I remember that as another such a big case. Did you ever like gain any insight into maybe not so much what went wrong with her, but maybe where the wires were just a little differently crossed or, or connected in her brain or any idea from maybe her upbringing that maybe caused that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, her... her I think all of her brothers went to Stanford. Her dad was uh, a politician um, who was part of the John Birch Society. Her mom used to debate Gloria Allred on the ERA on TV. You know, she went through a childhood that was pretty um, uneventful until her brother drowned in a pool and then there was some blame. I think she felt for that. I think in a lot of ways she had arrested development and some of the doctors that examined her talked about potentially bipolar disorder, histrionic, personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, some things like that. The fact is she fell in love with somebody that was extremely inappropriate. I mean, it's child abuse and she went to prison for seven years for that. She saw it as a love story. Um, they eventually got married. They had two children together who have done really well. She died last year. But I think that it, it, it was the first case like that and it, it just right. shocked everybody. And, and I think you have to look at someone like Mary and say, you know, he, he, she, she's intelligent. She was a great teacher. She was well loved, and and she fell into this in, in a way that people just can't imagine. But there were some explanations, like I just described, for what made her tick and what made her end up in this relationship. Yeah, because that's it's it's. I have a brother that's schizophrenic, and and mm -hmm. and you mentioned all these, you know, the brothers or kids or, or different siblings or whatever was in Stanford and the father and a pretty typical upbringing, it sounds like in the case for her. And then mm -hmm. she falls in love with somebody. But the thing that I always describe my brother is he doesn't have good impulse control. You know, right. if he, he wants to go up and say something inappropriate to a woman, you know, somebody else might think, well, you can't say that. That's not appropriate right. to say, but he just goes up and says it and, and he yep. doesn't have that. And so I always think it's interesting because it's helped me as I've gotten older to have more empathy and really to understand. But David, you don't know how they were brought up or what happened, because typically, like you said, I don't think that there'd been a case like that that really happened that far. Had there no. was somebody like that before? No, and then, and then, of course, we've heard from many ever, ever since, not many, but there's been others, some say copycats, some just say, you know, that there were, this was always going on, but that Mary was the first one that hit the news. Our defense was her case shocked everybody. So why would my police officers have thought she was involved with a 13 year old, you know, when mm -hmm. she was clearly an adult with four children of her own, but I, I got to know her pretty well. She helped my case because she was on our side. She didn't want it to be a crime story. She wanted it to be a love story. Mm. And she was very intelligent. And I think, um, you know, she ended up becoming a paralegal. And I, when she died, I had a note from the lawyer she worked for. And he said she's the best paralegal I ever had. Wow. Very, very smart, very accomplished, very dedicated. Wow. And that, mm -hmm. that also maybe in a basic sense speaks to, I don't know if I could say affairs from the heart, but here's somebody who's very smart, the best paralegal ever. And somebody mm -hmm. was very bright and came from a bright family and just, you know, went down a path that's just not typical. And most people have, I don't know whether it's the impulse control or just the ability not to do it, but gosh, what a, it's kind of a neat story how it ended up in a way. Right. And, and the, she got together with Billy when her dad was diagnosed with cancer. She was very close to him. And when she was in prison, he passed and she wasn't able to go to the funeral. But I think you know, a lot of folks, when something really catastrophic happens, you know, can act out. And I, and I think those circumstances where she saw Billy as somebody that was attentive, of course, when someone's in that young, I mean, they're going to be very attentive to their teacher. And, and I think it just 
it was the circumstances, but also her psyche and her issues and, and her upbringing. And one other thing, I think three of her brothers worked in the Trump administration too. So, um, you know, they, they all were, were very accomplished. And one other thing, her dad was um, kind of vilified. He was arch conservative. And when people protested in front of their house in Orange County, she mm -hmm. would blast German marching music out the windows. Oh, wow. wow. I know. So there's a something about her in her past. Gosh. Well, and I, I know you and I had talked previously about this, which I think is really interesting is, is the families we were born into. And you're from a very accomplished family. You're the father. It's a psychiatrist and your mom mm -hmm. and your stepmom mm -hmm. and just the, your brothers, your siblings. And I always, I call it the birth lottery because, you know, all of a sudden one day on January 28th, 1950, little David Brooke appeared in Spokane, uh -huh. Washington. And I had nothing to say about it except my father and all, all those guys were attorneys, which I've mentioned in the past, but uh -huh. I call it the birth lottery because it's just, it's just a lucky thing that sometimes it just works out and, and sometimes it doesn't. And I look at your situation and I think, as you explained to me before, it just seems like there was a very subtle expectation that you will do something good in your life. And I think all how different that would be if you were in a different set of circumstances. Right. And that's why, uh, I mean, because I think of the people that were really, that were your role models, you know, certainly you had a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, my parents still are, are very into um, philanthropy and they, they won an award for top um, philanthropists in the South Sound, they're down in Olympia, but they've always been involved in, in something bigger than themselves. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what they're all about. And it isn't for, it's not like self laudatory. It's just something that they feel driven to do. So that's what I was raised with is, is that, you know, I, there are things that you need to do and that, you know, for the public interest to help other people, things like that, but, but also to give financially, if you're able to do that and, and to give of yourself on boards, et cetera. And they both done that for a long time. And speaking of the birth lottery and being philanthropic, were their parents philanthropic? Your mom and dad? Yeah, my, my mom's parents were. My dad's parents were lived at a farm in Linden. And my grandpa was postmaster of Linden. Mm. And during the Depression, actually had a federal job. And I mean, he was lucky to have a federal job as postmaster, but they lived off the farm and had, there were five kids and all the kids went to college and medical school and one went to Harvard, the rest went to GPS. And my dad ended up at the Menninger Clinic in Kansas, which was a big deal at the time. So the kids, they won the brains lottery you know, in terms of mm -hmm. being able to, to accomplish great things. But money-wise, there, there wasn't really philanthropy, but they were very thoughtful people, my grandparents on my That's dad's cool. side. And when you think about that from... I remember talking about a brother that's a little more to the left and you were a little more to the right. Oh my gosh. Funny, which is yeah. just a little more to the left might be conservative, but mm -hmm. where do you think your motivation has come from? Because I look at somebody like you, Anne, who's done so much and, and you know, a lot of it's the person in the mirror, but then there's other people that I've met that seem to be really nice people just have very little motivation. And I'm sure some of it was the parents and the upbringing and so forth, but is there another place that kind of motivates that person you see brushing your teeth in the morning? Well, I think role models for many, many years, Nor Mailing in the prosecutor's office. I worked for yeah. a judge, Judge Dixon, who was fantastic. Tom Fry and my old firm and Faith. I've had wonderful mentors over the years that have really brought me up in terms of doing things that are more important than myself or my family or friends. I mean, something beyond that. I also think my, my first mother died when I was seven. And I think that, I think any kid that loses a parent has some feeling of legacy and, and wanting to do something that, that um, keeps their memory alive or at least would have made them proud. I don't know what that is, but I think most people have lost a parent as a young child, I think have the same feeling that I have. Yeah, yeah. And then I think there's kind of the nature versus nurture aspect. And again, I've said birth lottery a few times with the family we were born into and so on. And you lost your mother, obviously very young and that has an impact on you, but the, you mentioned earlier, I kind of like this, it's important to be something, a part of something bigger than yourself. So to the casual listener that's listening to this podcast or anybody in general, what, what's some, what's some things that Anne would tell people to do, to be a bigger, make something that's a better, you know, I can't even talk, be a bigger part of something bigger than yourself, rather. What would you, some be some suggestions you would say? 
Well, I just finished. I also want to say that my my mother, who married my dad after my mom died, is my mother, and she's been I know, I'm fantastic. Sorry. No, but she's. I mean, there's been nobody that has been more influential than she's been, and that's so cool. all my friends know it, all my family know it. So that's another thing I'm really grateful for. Yeah. Um, I think I'll give you an example of the way I look at it. I just came from a conference in Austin, Texas. It's called CrimeCon, but it's basically forensic scientists, um, bloggers, Netflix people, Dateline NBC, thousands of people come to this conference. And what they all have in common is they want to solve things, resolve things, help on crimes, learn new things. And something like that, the joy I saw in people's faces for wanting to be a part of our case, to find Susan Powell, to help kids that are in the custody of CPS in any state, to change the laws, that kind of a conference, even though it sounds funny, right, crime con, is an amazing way that I saw people come in and be a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And they were emotional. There were a lot of tears. There was a lot of, um, you know, connection. There was everyone from Bill Cosby's victims to Nancy Grace oh, wow. to um, Dr. Phil. I mean, there were the Dateline folks. Josh Mankiewicz is the mayor, of course, of CrimeCon. But I just, this most recent example I've seen where I just went and went, wow, that's really cool. The people came away from that so energized about wow. being part of something bigger than themselves. That's mm -hmm. what it was really about. So was it and CrimeCon, it, you know, like standing for crime conference or something? Or Yeah, yeah, I think so. And But there's so many things like that. There, there's just so many things like that where you, you can be, there's the... Um, renaissance weekends where folks just talk about bigger thoughts that are four times a year i think the clintons are part of that but that's that's an extreme example because you're ending up with with folks that are on a more high political level and then of course everyday folks like me i went once but that was a great time to talk about things that weren't just the, the kinds of things with we deal with their day to day i mean we get mm -hmm. those things in movies we get them in books we get them in on the internet, you know, greater ideas, but to actually physically get together with people and talk about great thoughts or ideas or about helping other people in the criminal justice system. Those are the kinds of things that, that come to mind for me. You know, I was just thinking, as you said that too, I'll, I'll do this offline and then um, maybe I'll email you and get some of those links like sure. to, to crime con or the Renaissance mm -hmm. fair, whatever, because those would be things that are really nice because I think sometimes there's a lot of people out there that really want to do these things. And as we say, be a part of something bigger than yourself, but don't know what to do. And right. sometimes just having the resources. And, and I've said many, many times that if you want to help yourself, help other people. And there's something exactly. when, when somebody says, Anne, I'll never forget when you did so and so. And you're the first person ever took the time. Any of those kinds of sentences, you just you can't put a price on it. It's, it's priceless about when somebody shows that their appreciation for something you've done for them. And I, I get a lot of that and what I get to do, which I feel so blessed. And sometimes mm -hmm. I actually get emotional about it because I think, gosh, I'm getting a chance to make a difference. And who wouldn't want that? So I think any of those resources, any other one or two, I thought it was a really cool crime con, any other one or two big takeaways from that in Austin? I, I just think it, it, I didn't expect it to be like that. I didn't expect it to be so, you know, amazingly uh, inspirational and but it was, and it was just an example of people getting together and, and having something in common, but they wanted to be for a concept and for others, you know, in a way that's bigger than themselves. And it went from folks that had been doing it for a few years to people that had never gone before. But when we, we gave a speech on Susan Cox Powell in our case, and the outpouring of love and support, we had 400 and some people there, was amazing. And we had we had these um, bracelets, Find Susan, with it, oh, the nice. website for helping other victims of domestic violence. We had hundreds of them, and they're gone. I mean, people were asking us wow. the whole time we were there. And I guess I felt like it was really gratifying to get to the, have the jurors verdict. And I'm so thankful for our jurors who came back during a pandemic. I mean, we were on hiatus oh, that's for a right. while. That's right. And they came back. But I was also grateful to, to these people for them to recognize and, and to feel a part of this case and to want to help. I mean, then there were people that encryption experts were trying to still figure out encryption on Josh Powell's computer, you know, search and rescue people that want to go help. And, and so I just thought that was, that was kind of an amazing thing. And, and I had my investigator, my co-counsel there, but it was really, really gratifying. Gosh, that sounds like it. And, and mm -hmm. speaking of the Powell case, I don't think I asked you this, but how long was that in jurors? Because I, you know, I don't think they were sequestered, but how long was the total case for the jurors and everything? How long did it last? 
It started on February the 10th last year and it ended in July, but we recessed March 17th because of the, the pandemic. Right. And, and all the jurors, all, all the jurors came back wow. and then heard the last few weeks of the case and, and reached a verdict. I, I, I've never seen anything like that, that you can recess a case for months. I'm trying to think March, April, May, June, June four months, almost five months. And they still came back and heard the rest of the case. And I I know, yeah, I think they had a feeling of duty that that Mm -hmm. it was up to them to decide this case the right way. You know, I I get everybody talks every so often about jury duty. It's kind of a right that you have. And if you're a voter and then they they send you a notice. And I've had typically people say to me, I'm going to make an excuse or I'm going to tell my employer I I can't do it or whatever. And a number of years ago, I um, was on a jury and. I thought it was phenomenal. Even though I come from these attorneys, it was assault with a deadly weapon. And at the end, I decided that my leadership skills must just come out or something without me even opening my mouth because we never said uh-huh. anything. And all 12 of us go into this room after about a five-day trial and the bailiff comes in and he says, the first thing you need to do is, is uh, elect the jury foreman and then take an initial vote and then let us know if you want any exhibits or anything. Is, that, is, every, is everybody okay? Everybody kind of nods red. The door closes and 10 of the people go, we want you to be the foreman. <laughs> I've been totally predictable, well, perfect well, foreman. Well, how did that happen? <laughs> I didn't even say anything, but I thought it was, I, I'm, I felt so adamant about it after that experience that- I think it should be mandatory that everybody does it because it's just such a phenomenal process. And again, for those jurors to be be in the middle of the pandemic and then they come back and then with the verdict that they came up with, and it's just, it's just such a cool thing. And to get 12 people to agree on anything I know, is, I is know. a miracle. So I think that's just really cool. That's really Yeah. And cool. they're really, they're really cool people. And I, we've stayed in touch. We had a big luncheon for everybody and heard all their thoughts and, and all the ways they want to help. And, and I still, and I, I'm on a text list with all of them and, and they're, they, it, they continually have talked about being bigger than something, being part of something bigger than themselves. And, and they're very invested in, in their verdict, but also in the aftermath. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things too, when you mentioned your parents and, and parents, parents uh, being philanthropic, that there's people that there's many other ways too to to do things. I've met people that don't have two nickels rubbed together. Some of the most philanthropic people I've ever met. You know, and they're right. out volunteering, and and people will ask me after a talk sometimes, well, what can I do? And I'll talk about you know, go to church and volunteer at the church and go to a food bank right. and go to. There's so many things you can do, and just the feeling you get as you walk away. I mean, it's just. And I think you and I had chatted about this before, but. I, I didn't know this was going to be the benefit of what I do. And I know what you do as well as these people say, well, I can't believe you. the thing you said about so-and-so, the exercise you did about this, that was the neatest thing. It made me feel like I'm not the only person in the world. And it's just all that kind of thing where right. you're showing other people you're not alone, which is so important. So no, important. exactly. And you're so inspirational. And I love the gratitude guy. That's perfect. Ah, thank you. Well, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. I usually go about a half hour and stuff. So let me ask you this. What are the top three things that Ann Bremner is grateful for? Top three things for my family, of course, uh, my parents and my siblings. The second thing is for, you know, my friends and the extended network I have of folks, you know, including you that I look up to and learn a lot from and, and inspired by. And I think the third thing is, I don't want to say it, but it's my cat, Jimmy. Mm. I mean, he's up in the, he's up in the, up there. I just lost a special needs cat um, that really broke my heart and my little kitty's heart. So the, I've been grateful during the pandemic to have my little roommate here that keeps right. me going. And I want you to officially, me- I want, sorry to interrupt. I want you to officially not feel bad about that anymore. You mentioned that before about it. it's my cat because it kind of goes back to that line, which I love is better to have loved at all than never loved at all or loved and lost rather than never loved at all. <clears throat> and to know a relationship. In fact, there's people, I might even be in this group that you could argue the relationship that people have sometimes with their animals, cats, dogs, and others is mm-hmm. even stronger than I know. human to human because it's a one way, nothing but love. And I was mm-hmm. revisiting Dale Carnegie's uh, win friends and influence people book. And right. 
gosh, and he, he had so many great things. And that was 40 or 50 years ago and show a genuine interest in other people and don't talk about yourself and so on. But then he said right. the best example of a friend and he starts describing it. And I realize he's describing a dog, you know, that comes <laughs> running and comes up and jumps on you, yeah. and you and just is always happy to see you and so forth. And so I thought, yeah, so I think that however it comes from, but, but I think the reason why I think, and I'll end on this, but is family and siblings friends, uh, Jimmy the cat, and there's a lot of people and it sounds negative. I don't mean it that way, but I meet quite a few people that don't have much of a family or don't have any friends. I and know. I, I don't know if they miss something or because a friendship is a two-way street and it takes give and take and push and pull and, you know, uh, efforts on, you want to go to coffee? You want to go to coffee? I mean, it has to go back and forth, but, but they seem like the nicest people. I just feel bad because family and friends, that's the, sort of the corner post or the, the foundation of which we all really are, supports us, I think. I know. And I always, I always quote Voltaire. I, I have an embarrassment of riches in my family and friends. Mm. I'm just so lucky. Mm -hmm. Lifelong friends, friends since I was a little kid, since grade school, since law school, but we're also, and people could talk about other important things like, of course, their faith. I'm, and I'm not, some, I'm not, that's something, something I want to talk about other than to say, the cat thing is more just the pandemic, but I know the most important things to most people are their, um, their own, their own faith, their family, uh, their friends, and maybe institutions with which they're involved, anything bigger than themselves. But I think with the pandem pandemic, we've all started to realize how important our friends and family are, how important our relationships are, how important contact is, you know, and how important, uh, I think an intellectual and emotional, and I think life of faith is important too. Yeah. Those are all things that maybe get lost, but maybe were picked up again by many of us, yeah. importantly, during the pandemic. I did a video recently titled Sex, Religion, and Politics. And when I grew up, we were told over and over again, don't ever talk about I know, sex, religion, about and politics. And I just right. thought, who picked out those three things? But But you're so right. right. And so I think kind of the nuggets that I take away from today is the certainly being a bigger a part of something bigger than yourself and how you do that, the crime con thing. And as I said, I'll get that from you later and I'll put that in the okay. show notes, but just different opportunities that people have. And then the importance of faith and family and friends and mm -hmm. just being grateful, my favorite word, for mm -hmm. having winning the birth lottery and being born into a situation where it was physically and mentally and emotionally healthy. And then right. you get to spring up from that and that's the, the nature. And then you get the nurture that comes with it and stuff. So, because I think the role model, I had a, a entrepreneurs club mastermind a couple of nights ago with my son and 15 of his friends in San Diego. Mm -hmm. and this one gal says, I want to manage people. And I said, well, what do you think is the key to managing people? And she uh -huh. said, she said, empathy. And I said, well, that's, I, I agree. That's empathy uh -huh. as, as I define it as being able to put yourself in their shoes and understand what they're going through and, and mm -hmm. what, how their life is. And, and I said, but I think the ones at the top of the list, in my opinion, having managed a lot of people is I think you have to set a really good example. And you know, I think that's exactly than anything else. And so it's fun when you get to be that person like you are up front that people look to and they, they hear what you say, but, but maybe more importantly, they watch what you do. Well, that would be you. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just trying to keep up with you. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Here, anyway. All right. Well, and thank you. Thank you so much. That's going to be it for this episode. Thank you. You bet. Uh, just a reminder, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available wherever you get podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, et cetera. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear, which I really appreciate. And as I mentioned earlier, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. You can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com and email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And to connect with my guest and me, I put her uh, Anne's notes in the uh, websites and so forth in the contact information. I am going to add those other resources I mentioned as well. Uh, also, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute video that goes out every Monday at 6 a.m., you can go to your phone and text 228 22828 rather 22828 and text that number and type in gratitude guy and that will get you the Monday morning minute and my guest on June 22nd will be Cornelia Stephanie who heads up the Cornelia Stephanie media group 
She will share, share some great stories of how gratitude inspired and encouraged her along the way. And then a lot of people ask me about the gratitude journal. I've had the Brookers one, this newest one I have, and it's not going to show up on that deal. It's that gratitude guys daily gratitude journal. And that is available on my website. So Thank you so much for turning in, tuning in. Until next time, I'm David George Brooke, that gratitude guy. And remember, I always say it at the end. Remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.